things today. Uh, reminder that we are live on the internet with question and answer enabled so you can ask all kinds of questions, hopefully about bicycles. And if you need to know how much Shuda here can bench press, you can ask that as well. So thanks for joining us today. We are going to be introducing three all new competitive bikes, one on the road, two on the mountain. Let's get into the goods. My good buddy here, Eric Shuda, is gonna be walking us through. He's been with the company now for, what is it, eight, nine years? Almost a decade. Wow, wow, and just they just keep getting better every time you pop out a new bike. So Shuda in charge of the room, uh, the road, the room, these new tarmacs, and this is one of my favorite slides to talk about. This has been a part of Specialized for many years now. And when you look at the history of the tarmac, this I think you can always point out which where you started your journey out here. Mine was, was this one. Uh, I almost crashed the very first time I rode it because it was so shocking to me to ride a carbon bike. Which one was your first one? So my journey with tarmac started way back from the beginning, but it was selling these two working at retail, my first tarmac was the SL2. Oh yeah, and then also important to note here is the SL4 version, this is where we introduced the Amira for the first time, so men's and women's on the competitive side. So what are we talking about? We are talking about competitive riders, looking to go fast, up, down, all over the place. We like to work with normal people, like you and me, uh, but also with the professionals, we like to race, we like to win. This is where we learn, this is where we test things, this is where we just beat the crap out of everything so we can extract every bit of performance out of these bikes. So, so excited to introduce for the first time the all new Rider First Engineered Tarmac. Nothing is lighter, faster, or better handling. This bike has been in the works for years. I know you're super pumped to get into the details on here, but there's four things that we really want to hit on with this bike, and it's lighter, the better handling, the best handling, aero in compliance. And I think this is an interesting place to pause because we're not talking about making a light bike or a great handling bike or an aero bike. It's doing all of these four things, easy or hard. Yeah, Sam, this was extremely challenging. So these goals, they're all conflicting goals. Lightweight doesn't go with stiffness. Aero bikes are usually heavy. Aero bikes are usually not comfortable. So we basically set, because we love challenges here at Specialized, we set four conflicting goals, brought the team together. They screamed and yelled and kicked the whole time. And we checked all the boxes and made an amazing machine. Let's, let's get into those boxes. So, so lighter, it's a great thing to say, but what, what are the details? Incredible, 733 gram frame. This is a 14.25 pound bike straight out of the box in the S-Works version. Are these numbers made up? And then how'd you do it? These numbers are real. So Tarmac's always been known for handling and stiffness and we've used weight to help us get there. Uh, we talked a lot about that on the previous Tarmac. So the goal with this one was how do we maintain that Tarmac ride feel and knock weight out of it? So the way it was done is, you know, we're always getting better tools in our tool bags. We have, we're hiring smarter people. We have new analysis software that allows us to really get into the nuts and bolts of the layup and refine it. We're using more pieces. So each frame is built kind of, we say kind of like puzzle pieces. The previous Tarmac was about 300 carbon pieces. We've gone up to 500 on the new bike. So we're able to go in there and like pinpoint control exactly how thick the carbon needs to be, what material do we need, and what do we not need more specifically. So more investment in higher materials, more complex layup, better tools, and more attention to detail when we're making the frames. So that results in a 733 gram S-Works frame in what we're calling an ultralight version. Ooh, I love the ultralight, just Me taking too. all the grams out of there. So super, super lightweight. This is, this is really kind of pushing us into this realm of ultra lightweight bikes, which is really important, uh, but also to balance out, it still has to be a tarmac. It's gotta be a great handling bike. It can't just fly up the hills. You gotta get down as well, work your way through the pack, through the corners, all that stuff. So rider first engineering, how important that is to the handling. And then let's talk about the, the geometry a bit. Yeah, so the, uh, the Rider First Engineering is the most important thing on the tarmac. So even though we just talked about the weight, when we set our project brief, Rider First was right there at the top. Uh, very many lightweight bikes do not handle well. They're noodles, right? So there was uh, a big challenge for us on the Rider First. And what Rider First is, it's really 
tailoring each frame size to the tarmac experience. What we mean by that is the recipe to make our smallest frame or our mid-sized frames or our larger frames ride like a tarmac is different. We have to go about it differently. The layup's different. The materials could be different in certain areas of the bike. So it's, a, it's custom tailoring it so that each rider gets the prescription of what a tarmac experience is. And that's done really in the things that you can't see. It's done in like what you see on the screen. It's done in layup. It's done in materials. It's done in tube shaping and sizing as well but it's not size specific, it's much deeper than that. It's a handling prescription, materials, all the things I just went over. So you end up getting size specific tubes in some ways, but you don't just start with size specific tubes. You wanna start with what does the rider really need in that particular size, and then that's just one exactly. of the Exactly, we're not, when we're setting this project charter, we're not even looking at the tube shape at first. We're setting what is the stiffness target that each size needs, what is the experience, you're right. And then from there, it manifests itself in tube shapes and materials, and it's a lot of things that you can't see on Perfect. the bike. But it ends up that, you know, no matter how, how vertically endowed or vertically challenged or wherever you are in the middle, you, you end up with a tarmac, a great handling bike that we've shown over and over again. Any changes to the, the geo of the bike? No, there's no changes to the geo of the bike. Uh, overall, the handling geo, there are a few things we did from a fit standpoint that we'll talk about in a second. This is a shared platform, so this tarmac is for all riders, uh, female and male. That's a big change too, and the you know so we to to round out the rider first, we do have three unique fork sizes depending on the the size of the bike. But for the first time, we have seven tarmac frame sizes, all the way from a 44 to a 61 to accommodate these competitive riders. So I want to push you off the stage, my dear friend. Say thanks very much and congratulations on the tarmac. We'll talk to you soon and pull up Stephanie Kaplan here, who's going to talk a little bit about why we moved to a shared platform and, and how, how that's going to feel for the rider. So Stephanie, welcome to the stage. Thank you. Thank you so much. Seven, seven frames here, 44 to 61. And here's, here's a big number that we want to talk about. Yeah, so this uh, started about uh, in December 2014, working with uh, one of uh, the companies that falls under the specialized banner, which is Retool. Uh, and we started with uh, working with Retool as they digitized their fit system, which gave us access to over 40,000 individual rider fits within their digitized database. And what that really means is when you, uh, when you utilize Retool and you go through a Retool fit, most of the time you're gonna be utilizing their Retool Move Bike which allows us to capture data points in space. It's one of the more advanced uh, fit systems in the world. So we're able to do data capture, not just handwritten uh, data, but actual digitized data. And this retool move mic doesn't care if you're a man or a woman. We're fitting you on the bike to see where you end up as far as stack and reach to the grip position. And what that allowed us to do was dig in a little further. So when we first looked at it, we noticed that there really weren't differences uh, that were attributed to gender. But when we looked at your experience, so competitive nature, endurance nature, et cetera, we saw that there really was obviously a difference in what riders needed as far as fit and uh, handling geometry. And we were able to utilize that retool fit database to strip gender away and actually create a uh, performance geometry that was optimized for the experience. So stepping into that idea that the bike is developed as a system, the frame is one piece, a very important piece, and thanks to Rider First Engineering and all the things that Eric just talked about, we have the best bike for a competitive-minded rider regardless of their gender. But where it's important, so we're talking about touch points, for example, we dig in even further. So working with Retool, working with our body geometry team and touch points, we make sure that these bikes are dialed for the rider from the shop floor out to their first race or out to a competitive ride, because uh, that's important for our female riders, it's important for our male riders, but we're excited to, to bring parity into the mix and offer men and women the best road bike on the market. It is important to point out that we will have the men's tarmac and the women's tarmac in the line. So you go in to your retailer and you pick which one's going to work best for you. So a big change, but an important change and a very, very well researched change. Uh, thank you very much for all the attention on that and very excited for this bike as well. Thanks very much, Stephanie.
The, we talked about the, the four things that we wanted to get after with the, the all new tarmac, and this was a lighter system, uh, the best handling of the tarmac, and the last two are the aero side of things as well as the compliance. And uh, he couldn't be here today because he is in Dusseldorf, the, the Dorfy Dorf uh, over there in Europe. Chris Yu, our aero expert, couldn't be here to join us today because he's at the tour, but we were able to uh, grab some time with him earlier this week to walk through both the aero and the compliance side of things. So we're gonna go ahead and, and play that video and uh, take a look at Chris Yu. So two things we started to talk about on the Rider First uh, Engineer Tarmac was the lighter, the better handling, uh, but now we want to bring up the aero side. I know this is, you know, right in your wheelhouse. Uh, we want to talk about the aero side and then compliance. I think, again, most people aren't going to be expecting this bike to have compliance built into it. So where did, why did you do the aero and how did you build in the compliance after that? Well, it's kind of interesting because for both aero and compliance, those came out from talking to our athletes and realizing that racing has changed, even in the last couple of years. For stages that we traditionally would think of as just pure climbing stages for lightweight bikes, they now have these extended fast sections where there's echelons, there's splits, and athletes just need aero performance to compete. And compliance, like the roads that most of these guys and women are racing on, are very rough, and a lot of times it affects the handling characteristics of the bike. And so both of those things that are, are features that we took very seriously in the R&D phase of the bike. Perfect. So looking at the bike, it, you know, it doesn't look blowing me away aero style, but it's faster. It's significantly faster Absolutely. than a standard style of lightweight bike and, and a competitor right in those aero bikes as well. So how did you do it? We're actually very proud of the way it looks and the fact that it's in many ways unassuming from an aero standpoint. And... The reasoning behind that is we embarked on six months of continuous research in aero, not to design an aero bike, but to figure out where can we develop aero features that bring in true performance without, and this is a key point, without impacting either the weight or the handling characteristics of a tarmac, because again, those are the important race characteristics of tarmac. Thread the needle. So exactly. And so through that through that research process, we found, surprisingly, because we didn't know what we were going to find, that there were actually three areas on the bike where we could extract considerable aero performance with literally zero impact on how much the bike would weigh or on any of the rider-first handling characteristics that we set out to meet. Perfect. And so those three areas were the fork, the drop seat stays, which are now a feature among all of the specialized road race bikes, mm -hmm. as well as the seat tube and seat post shape. And, and I'll hit on that last one again because we're really proud of this shape. It's a very, very uniquely optimized shape where we're trying to balance, we'll get to in a second, compliance, but also rider first uh, stiffness targets in the rear, as well as aero performance. And through this uh, unique co-optimization process that we went through, we're able to achieve a post that matches the aero performance of a lot of full-on aero seat uh, tube depths but at the same time be more compliant than a typical round seat post. So the fork, the seat tube, seat post area, and then the drop stays, we were able to bring up a whole lot of aero style uh, of performance. And, and I'm looking at this, this down tube and it, like, it's, it looks great, but it doesn't, to me, it doesn't look aero. Is, is this an aero down tube or? That's a great question. And so part of that six month process was to figure out for every single tube on the bike, what is the trade-off to get aero performance versus weight and handling characteristics? And for specifically the down tube, top tube, and head tube, we found that we could push pretty far in terms of extracting a little bit of aero performance out of it, but past a certain point, we started to pick up weight and we started to lose some of those handling characteristics. And so we pushed right up to that limit. And so the down tube's not, to the eye it looks round, but it's actually got a pretty unique shape to it as well. But we didn't go as far as say the seat tube and seat post. But the performance is still there, you got the weight, you got the, the arrow out of there, the great handling bike, perfect. So uh, job well done. And then the last part we wanted to touch on again is that compliance side of things. So this arrow style seat, seat tube and seat post. I do want to hit though on the arrow side that, um, you know, all these features, they may not look to the eye like very aggressive features, but they do add up to substantial performance okay. to the point where this entire package is on par with nearly every other full-on aero bike uh -huh. out there. And so compared to a traditional lightweight bike, it's about 45 seconds over 40 kilometers faster. So that's, that's substantial performance for something that doesn't scream visually aero. That's, that's a big difference. If you like, you know, look at your clock right now and then say go, 
and count off 45 long seconds. Time. Your competitor is a long way behind you uh, by the time they come around to the next bend. So, yeah, 45 seconds, that's, that's a huge, huge advantage. And, hey, you're going to get to that 45 seconds, not as beat up as that other person on a, on a different bike. Let's talk about the compliance. Exactly. So that's one of the things where once we started to develop something that's not around C-Post, just even a mental reaction from our athletes was – hey, is it going to be more harsh? Because that typically has been the case for pretty much every bike up to now. And so we were able to, in a combination using layup and the drop stays, and also a very, very unique layup design in the seat post, have a system that's actually not just equal in compliance, but more compliant than our previous bike with the round seat post. Oh, wow. That's, that's, that'll pay dividends on those, those long, long days on the bike. So Rider First Engineer Tarmac, we talked about the weight, the handling, the arrow, congratulations. You had a wind tunnel. I had to do something with it, right? And then also making this a compliant ride. Anything else you want to touch on, Chris, on this uh, pretty rad new tarmac? I think all of that, I, it's hard to kind of comprehend the scale of all those different four things. And I, I strongly believe that this is the first bike in the history of road bikes that breaks out of that single category mold of performance, whether it's a lightweight bike or an aero bike. If we think about it, that's how we choose road bikes. This is simply the best race bike yeah just competitive all across the board and if you're looking for that that speed up down across this is the bike for you right exactly so the two things we started to talk about on the rider first uh, engineer tarmac bikes are getting faster chris you is dusseldorfin that was fun to do the tarmac that's one of the three competitive bikes today and coming up next brian gordon project manager product manager for the mountain bike team we've got an all-new epic to talk about. So we talked about going fast on the road, but, man, we've been going fast on the mountain for years and years now. Did you know that the epic, there's going to be 15 years of epics now. Uh, we like to win. We like to go fast. We like to work with the pros to, to really get after how hard these bikes can be ridden and how much we can push them. Sam Gaze, world champion on these bikes. Annika Longvad. Uh, world champion on these bikes and how can we continue to give riders racers the best most fun tool uh, out there on the courses so this is the world's fastest xc bike rider first engineered epic so brian you've been working on this for a few years now i think a pretty fun project oh, yeah. and uh, the three main things that you were trying to get after is make this bike lighter smarter and faster and for really the, the first time getting really deep into the rider first engineering side that helped us get to a lighter state as well as a better handling state as well. So go ahead and talk to us a little bit more about the, the weight of this all new Epic. Yeah, yeah, so we'll go through some rider first engineering stuff. The first mountain bike we introduced that on was the Epic Hardtail, which you guys should all be familiar with now. Uh, we utilized all of our research in rider characteristics and tuned the tube shapes, the tube sizes, the layup to create a ride that is similar for each rider on each different size. So this creates a better ride along the entire line of sizes. So weight savings in the entire frame from the previous Epic that we know from 2017, 345 grams lighter on the S-Works level and 525 in the comp and expert levels. That's nothing to, to scoff at. I mean, 345 grams out of an already super lightweight frame. This is the, the frame that's on the S-Works, the highest level one, but really, really exciting. On your comp, your expert, your pro, we go to a full carbon frame and pull more than a pound out of that thing. That is absolutely insane. And to put a little bit of perspective in here, Brian, what, what are we looking at here? So this is the chainstay from the previous Epic World Cup. And a shock extension, a few pieces of hardware. No one wants to carry that around on their bike as a spare chainstay in case you hit a rock. So we decided to pull that off and give you guys a frame so you can ride without a spare chainstay. <laughs> just to be very clear, we're not, the bike still has a chainstay on there. We're just saying that this is the equivalent of losing 345 grams out of that, that 12M frame. Uh, similarly, on when you, what is 525 grams looks like? That would be like riding an Epic without any of these pieces on here from the previous platform, pulling out over a pound. That is huge. And just so you know, that's actually the same as the vegan friendly pile of Oreos. That is 37 and a half Oreos for your off season 
indulging or Brian's breakfast or my breakfast <laughs> lunch and dinner so huge weight savings uh, across the frame uh, this, this is just and you can feel it when you're riding the bike it helps with the acceleration helps you get over the mountains uh, but I really want to pause and, and point out that we go to a full carbon rear end and what are some of the major changes here and, and the results of that yeah so looking at the suspension suspension kinematics is it going? You're good, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Looking at the suspension kinematics, um, we previously had a horse link on the rear end, and we've looked at ways to eliminate those extra pivots and bearings by tuning the flex in the rear triangle so we can maintain a wheel path that still rides super nice, just like the previous bike, but in, meanwhile saving 39% out of the rear triangle. That is 240 grams in just that rear half of the frame. So here's a close up of the rear triangle. It's super streamlined, clean looking now. Uh, internal cable routing, of course. And yeah, you'll notice no pivot there. But we do have flex that comes out. So that old pivot was rotating about three degrees. And now we can get that through the carbon tuning and maintain that wheel path that we want. So the big, the, the important part is we still absolutely believe in the performance for the rider. You know, a, a bike that's going to accelerate, track during braking, uh, do everything that you're going to need it to do. But if we could take weight out of the system, then that's what we we're going to do. Ultimately, that's what we wanted to make it lighter for that competitive rider. So this is a single pivot epic. Does that mean that we are walking away from FSR? We think it's a no good system anymore? Absolutely not. We will still continue to run that through all of our longer travel bikes where we see much more uh, differentiation and where we can't tune the carbon to flex as much. But on this 100 mil platform, we were able to do it with the carbon when we're pretty stoked about it because now the bike is way lighter, way faster. Rear end feels awesome, super supple. So, Perfect. Awesome. Brian, it's a beautiful bike. And, and talking about that rear end and how we're getting that squishiness coming out of the side of things, we'll see you back on stage in a little bit. And we're going we're gonna to pull up the master himself. Mike McAndrews to talk about the brain. We have some major shifts in the details of the brain and how we got to that. Hey Mick, welcome to the stage. Hey Sam, thanks for having me. <laughs> uh, but before we get into the nuts and bolts, Mick's favorite part of course, I, I think it's, it's really important to point out that while we've changed so much, nothing has changed in terms of the 15 year history and concept of the brain. The only shock that can differentiate between rider inputs, somebody bouncing around on the seat, and terrain inputs, smacking bumps, hitting logs. When, it's, when the rider is, wants to accelerate and move the bike forward, we want a firm platform, but as soon as you hit an obstacle, you have control, active suspension, and that has never changed in the concept of the brain. Is that correct? You're exactly correct with that. Um, obviously, we've evolved that concept uh, every generation of shock and bike that we designed, but that, that true, that, that, that vision that started the EPIC project is still true today. And that's that chassis support, when you can provide that chassis support that's a different value than the bump uh, performance of a shock absorber, that's how we get the efficiency out of a full suspension cross-country race bike. Perfect. So what's going on in these photos here? What are you guys, what are you guys looking at? Well, we do a lot of testing. We get a lot of feedback from our racers, both internally and then also at the World Cup level. We, but a lot of that, we move away from subjective feedback and actually quantify a lot of the testing so we understand uh, at a high level what's going on. The, this new shock for the, for the new bike um, is an all new design from the ground up. Um, there were no parts left over from the previous generation and we did that because we wanted to design a shock absorber that did everything at a very high level. This particular design iteration, we focused as much, probably more so, on the ride quality of the shock absorber in the open position as we did with the brain itself. And the reason we do that is the chassis stability that the brain gives us obviously provides a really good pedal efficiency to get up to speed and makes the bike uh, very efficient for the rider. But momentum carry is something that we focus a lot on, and that's the bike's ability to carry that speed through the bumps. So a lot of work went into how we manage the bumps when we're in the open mode on this new design. So no, no stone left unturned. You're right. Looking at the rear end here, we gave the brain a bit of a lobotomy, split yes, it out to two yes, pieces. Yes. So we've got the top and the bottom. What, yes. what are the reasons here? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's not unlike the old designs. We used to just run it all in tandem before, but we did separate it for tighter packaging. One of the things you're gonna notice is that the brain is now back by the axle. And the original brain, we had it, a kind of a crazy design where it was over the axle. 
we knew that because there's a relationship between the, the axle movement at the rear wheel and the inertia valve or the brain. And moving it, it, it used to be up here, it kind of kept moving up as disc brakes and, and other things were, were brought into the mix. Um, and it used to have a motion ratio of 0.8 to 1. And that, that ratio is very important to the sensitivity of the brain. So putting it back here by the axle gives us a 1 to 1, actually slightly better, but a 1 to 1 ratio, which makes the brain very sensitive. So the efficiency of the brain is greatly improved. But the layout here, we spent a lot a lot of time focusing on fluid flow through the system so that we minimize damping hysteresis, which is important for grip and traction, and just that, that little sketchiness uh, that a rider can feel, it just straightens all that out. And, and when you ride the bikes, it, it is so apparent that it's just such, a, such an improved system. Not that there's anything wrong with the old one, but always room to make it a little bit better. Going yeah, I gotta keep right. moving forward. So yeah. we've got the inertia valve and the circuitry packed in here. And then this top part, we have moved away from having the IFP design down mm -hmm. below and now go to a bladder system. That's correct. And this gets back to kind of that ride dynamics in the open mode. It's very common in our industry to use a separator piston or an IFP, internal floating piston, to separate the nitrogen charge from the fluid in the shock absorber. The problem with IFPs we found, and our service centers kind of taught us this because we would see a lot of the old reservoirs with a high amount of wear. What that tells me when the IFP is wearing, it's actually cocking and almost fluttering in its movement. If it's fluttering here, we're feeling that direct flutter at the shaft, which means that's happening at the wheel. Mm -hmm. So a bladder is just a membrane that separates that nitrogen charge from the fluid, but it, it just collapses and expands as the shaft is moving. Very fluid, no stick slip motion. Again, helping the grip, the suppleness. Absolutely. It, no stone unturned, buddy. Exactly, exactly. So we're gonna we're gonna move from the very back of the system. We're gonna slide up the seat stay, and we've got a, a really cool trick that uh, Mick and the guys came up with is what we can do with the the hose routing and how the oil will flow into into the the air sleeves uh, area up towards the top. So Mick, crazy trick here. What would you do? Well, again, you know, looking at fluid flow again with the objective of, of really uh, keeping the fluid flow in what we call a laminar pattern rather than a turbulent pattern. So what we've got here is we've got the shock clevis, which is now part of the shock body, and then the hose is, is attached here. We have porting that runs through this spar and feeds the hose. So we have a, a nice shot into the spar, the port, and then a straight shot out of the hose. So it just, that fluid just... So you're pushing the, you're pushing the oil straight through the metal. That's right. That's right. And, That's it's, right. and it's much better for the oil flow, and it allows us to go to a 30.9 seat post, exactly. get a better hose routing, yeah. get rid of that noodle that was there before. Very, very cool design. Uh, and, and finally, we're moving to uh, an all-new shock system. So you said that no stone left unturned, or I said that, uh, but we, we build this design, and then we work with our partners. So switch to rock shocks. It's a big change. It is a big change, but maybe not as big as one, uh, one might think. And the reason I say that is all of the brain technology is housed, uh, the development is housed within the, our group here at Specialized that I manage. And we've been doing brain cartridges with the RockShox team for this bike for many years, probably seven, eight years now. We design the brain cartridge. We work with their engineering and manufacturing team to bring it to market. This particular shock, because everything was brand new on it, and again, we do all the design, we do all the, the drawings, everything, getting it ready to go. When it comes time to hand it off to our manufacturing partner, there's a merge that happens. We merge this project into their engineering and manufacturing team. It's critical that uh, the timing, once we start the merge, aligns with the overall objective of when we release the product. This time around, because it was all new, we could go with either supplier, and they've both proven to be top-notch suppliers. RockShox was in a better position to accept the, this particular project for this model year. They could hit our objectives as far as mainly the timing, getting this thing to market. Absolutely great partners on, on either side. Exactly. But important point exactly. to, to point out yeah. that we, we are up with the RockShox now. that still has an auto sag yeah. uh, system, and again, the, the brain. Uh, completely new, but again, never have changed. And that what we're trying to do, what we're delivering to the rider, yeah. is the the only shock that knows the difference between rider input and terrain input. So they don't have to worry about it. They just go as fast as they can, all the time, up, down, and all around. 
Mick, thanks very much for your time. My Stay pleasure. tuned for the questions and answers. I look I'm forward to it. I'm sure there's going to be some hot ones coming in. Right. And so we've talked about, thanks very much, Mick. Uh, we've talked about the weight. We've talked about making this bike smarter. And let's now finish it out with how we made this thing faster. So a little bit of history, then versus now. If you look at these two photos, uh, you're looking at the Olympics course on the left. This is uh, London 2012. Now, that was a great race for sure. Uh, but the course was you know, a uh, little golf course looky. It wasn't so technical, not a whole lot going on. Uh, it was very, very fast. And you fast forward just a few years, just, just three years difference, and we're looking at the World Cup courses. Rocky, Rudy, really gnarly. And as the courses are evolving, the riders are evolving, the equipment, the bikes must evolve as well for everybody. So how can we make these bikes better handling, more fun, ultimately faster? And when you're riding old style of equipment, on these new crazy terrains, hey, you're gonna, you might just get a little rock sampling for breakfast. We want people having fun, uh, whether you are a, a man or a woman, uh, making sure that you've got the best handling possible. So I'm gonna pull Brian Gordon back over here to talk about a really significant shift in the way that we work on the handling of the Epic and therefore how the geometry is going to change. So Brian, I've ridden this bike with you, uh, mostly from behind, because you're moving quick, but how is this handling better, faster for those competitive riders? Yeah, so we didn't really just want to focus on the competitive riders because from working retail, we all know that probably upwards of 90% of these riders are just going out to enjoy the trails and they don't want to be scared on the downhill. So it was huge focus to bring confidence and we know that that would benefit our racers as well. So we know a lot from trail bikes. We know longer, slacker, all the all the stuff that makes the bike handle great downhill. But for this bike, we need it to be snappy and handle quick and pedal well uphill. Um, and that's a huge focus, obviously, for the Epic. So uh, we did a couple things that we know work. So a little bit shorter stem to uh, accommodate that. We went with longer reach and we slackened the head tube angle at one and a half degrees. Uh, this is actually an overlay of two of my bikes. You can see the fit is maintained the same. Uh, longer reach, the blue overlay is the new Epic. So longer reach, um, shorter stem, can maintain cockpit length, and then we've gone to a slacker head tube angle and reduced offset. The reduced offset was a concept that we chose because it allowed us to bring that snappy handling back and the bike still corners super well. Um, and it gives us a trail number that we see on our longer travel bikes that creates a super stable handling. It's very confidence inspiring, but it doesn't reduce that nimble through like slow technical rock gardens or uphill switchbacks, downhill switchbacks. It still handles great through there. It also made the front wheel feel much more planted through corners and loose stuff. Um, another update is the rear end is a little bit shorter. We went four millimeters shorter on the rear triangle to enhance the cornering there as well. And uh, to further make the bike more confident, 30.9 seat posts, so you c it can accommodate full-length dropper seat posts now. We're seeing that super popular in cross-country racing and just riding in general, so we definitely wanted to make that change for the new Epic. Yeah, hu huge update, and it seems like small number changes, but when you ride the bike, it still explodes up the hill like you would expect any Epic to, but now in a, a lighter, smarter package. But really when it comes to life is when you're pointing this thing downhill and the, the confidence is just blown away like th it should not be able to do that is is what's yeah. going through my mind but it does it's just it's so fun to ride in in every direction so very very cool great work on this new epic the world's fastest xc bike lighter smarter faster can't wait for everybody to throw a leg over this thing it's just a, a fantastic bike and so that's two of our competitive bikes and to, and to round out uh this is actually i might be most excited about this last one here this is an all-new bike uh, called the Chisel. And who we were looking at here is still this competitive rider, uh, somebody that wants to go fast and sweat it out and go flying up the hills, uh, but also maybe somebody a little bit younger, somebody that doesn't want to spend nearly as much money on the bike. And so the Chisel, this is a Deluzio Smart Weld hardtail, performance for the people. And we were looking to take weight out of the bike make it super confident on the downhill while incorporating in some really key modern features. And uh, so this is the, the all new chisel. Brian, you worked on this bike as well. And I think that the big headline, it's a Deluzio Smart World frame. 1,350 grams, this is an aluminum frame. That's insane. That is lighter than our carbon frame hardtail was just a couple of years ago. So absolutely huge, huge achievement. 
And in bringing smart well technology into this, can you explain a little bit about what that is and, and why we do that? Yeah, of course. So this is the first time we've introduced smart weld on mountain bikes, and we're very excited about it, obviously. Um, you can see kind of our uh, raw tube layup there. So a couple ways we get benefits out of this. It makes a very much lighter tube, and it also helps increase stiffness. So we have a little analogy here. This is a Coke can. Everyone has probably seen one of these at some point in their life. If you squeeze the can this way, there's just a round edge, and that's kind of what we compare to a standard metal tube. If you roll the edges, as you can see here, it's very stiff. You're unable to compress it anymore, so that allows us to make a much thinner wall and maintain the stiffness out of the tube. Um, Another way this helped us reduce weight is when all the tubes fit together nicely, we don't have to fill gaps with weld. So that is less material. And since we have less weld material, we don't have to heat the tubes as long. So we're able to reduce the thickness of the tubes here as well. And we don't have heat through um, and fatiguing of the tube. So it allows us to save weight. That's why we've gone over 250 grams lighter than our previous stump jumper and epic hardtail alloy frames. Uh, yeah, and along with that, we've gone, we've kind of uh, taken what we did with Epic Hardtail 2, making the bike more confident, um, all the modern features, boost spacing, we have the same geometry that we use on Epic Hardtail, so slacker head tube angle, slightly longer reach, still the super short rear end for the nice cornering, and all the internal headset, internal cable routing, dropper post routing. It's still a 27.2 seat post for the compliance. Um, and we've also gone to a threaded bottom bracket for our durability. Another key thing to point out, the smart weld head tube is also found on the new Epic full suspension alloy frame. So that's a huge benefit for those comp level riders as well. Absolutely. And the, the, the technology that we're bringing to the aluminum side of things just gets me really, really pumped because, hey, everybody wants the performance. Not everybody wants to... I uh, can afford the carbon side of things, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't be able to go flying fast on these. So also a couple of cool things about the, the all new chisel. This is sub $2,000. We have two price points at $1,500 and uh, $1,850. You can run these one by or two by like this, this trick set up here. Uh, so however you want to be hitting the trails and hitting the races uh, with your drivetrain setup, totally possible. Uh, beautiful new bike. Very excited about this one. Me personally would like a pink one uh, just to just to have fun out there on the trails. So we talked about the handling, talked about the modern features, the chisel, performance for the people, to the Zeal Smart Weld on here. Brian, thanks very much. I think we've covered it all. We talked about the Rider First Engineered Tarmac and Epic, and then the performance for the people on the chisel. I think we're going to go to a live Q&A now to see what hair products Brian uses or ask us about a little bit more about these bikes going on. So thanks, everybody, for, for uh, being up here on stage. And we'll get the, the questions rolling. I'm sure they've been going the whole time. Thank you, Vanna. Uh, this question here is from Roberto. This one is for the tarmac. Come on over here, Brian. The mountain, mountain, mountain kids sit on this side of the stage. Come on up here, Mick. All right, so Roberto on the tarmac. Uh, I missed the distance for the 45 second savings. Please remind me. So, shoes, I think we're talking about uh, how arrow this thing is over 40 kilometers. What does 45 seconds mean? Correct. So, all of our arrow testing is done over 45 kilometers. It's just a, or over 40 kilometers, excuse me. It's just a standardized uh, test that we use, and it allows us just to be able to compare bikes relative to each other. So, it's 40 kilometers that we're talking about, which in miles is just under 25 miles, so depending on uh, how you measure your rides. Yeah, and so uh, compared to other lightweight bikes out there, uh, we are uh, roughly 45 seconds faster over that distance than another kind of, say, lightweight bike, and that's what's truly unique about the Tarmac is it is very lightweight, it is great handling, and it is aero while, while confident, uh, I'm sorry, compliant as well, and that combination is, is pretty tough. Yes, and just one uh, tidbit of information is that when we built the bike, our goal was to match the aero of the original bench, which depending on how you configure the bike, it's essentially there, which when you think about the weight of the original Venge versus the weight of the Tarmac, it's unreal. Take my money. All right, next question here, I think this is for Stephanie. What is the women bike size range? That's a great question. Thank so you. So women's bike size range starts at a size 44. So we're still accommodating the smallest riders that we were before. And it goes up to a size 56 in built bikes. 
But another really cool feature, to, thanks to the shared geometry, is that now women don't just have one frame uh, color to choose from. We've got over 20 frame colors to choose from. So uh, all of the frames will be shared, for example, because there aren't touch points on them, and will come in the entire range of sizes from 44 to 61. So men get to benefit. A lot of men like pink. Nothing wrong with that. I do, too. I do. Yeah. <laughs> so. Good, good answer. So next one. Uh, Tarmac, where is the junction box on DI2? Yeah, so the new Tarmac has new cable routing. Uh, we moved the cable routing to the top of the down tube. That way it's much more modular. If you're running electronic drivetrains, you don't have unused what we call bullets or nostrils on the side. The junction box itself goes in the handlebar. So all of the specialized handlebars can accept the new junction A from Shimano, and we've updated those to a hole for the cable routing. So if you received bars six months ago and wondered why there's a hole in them, it was in preparation for the new tarmac. A bar's got holes in them. <laughs> yep, correct. That was on purpose. Good job. All right, and then I think the uh, two more tarmac questions. What types? What type of brakes are used? Good ones. I would start with. Good ones. <laughs> yes. The new tarmac uses direct mount brakes, so it has it's a two bolt system. It mounts on the left and the right versus uh, pr our previous bikes use a center mount. The benefit of that is those brakes have uh, accommodations for more tire clearance. They also are more stiff in their design, so they have a more positive feel at the brake lever. When you're, when you're pulling the brakes, it just feels a little bit, just that extra bit more snap. Perfect. And they work really well, like shockingly well. Extremely well. Yeah, awesome. And final question on tarmac. What is the tire clearance? Who'd like to answer Stephanie that? Stephanie can answer that one. The tire clearance for the new rim brake version of the Tarmac is 30C, which is fantastic. Holy moly. Oh, yeah. Is this going to become spec with 30Cs or? No, the bike is spec with 26C tires, uh, but can come, uh, you can fit up to 30C thanks to those direct mount brakes. Dang, all the, all the tire clearance. I love tires, so I got to add one more thing. <laughs> the S-Works Tarmac comes with Turbo Cotton 26C, and when they're mounted to Roval CLX 50 or 32 rims with uh, extremely wide inner width. They actually measure 29 millimeters. Dang. So there's some comfy, fast, super rad tires on there. I think that was on purpose. For those that have followed Shooter's career for a while, his nickname for a long time was 29er, as he helped guide us through the, the uh, transition to these bigger wheels. So, hey, thank, guys, thanks very much on uh, the Tarmac, beautiful new bicycle. We're going to move over to the mountainside. Thanks, thanks again. All right, so on to the Epic. Whew, here's a squad over here. I just got word that uh, MTBR is tuned in to our, our webinar. I'm sure they wanted to hear these. Hi, MTBR. Thanks for joining. Uh, this one is from Kelly. Uh, does the new shock have a longer life? I think that one's for you, Mick. Yes. Thank, thank you, Mick. <laughs> um, obviously, some of the issues, uh, you know, we talked about the performance improvements that we made to it, but a lot of the things, uh, when we go through our service records and see where we can improve the design uh, for durability, those were incorporated as well. So I spoke of the bladder, uh, uh, putting that in and removing the IFP. That uh, was a, a big a issue, issue that, that uh, prevented the shock from, you know, going like at 100 hours and stuff. A lot of times that's where you would see the wear. So that addresses that issue. The other thing um, is this shock is really easy to service on the, the air sleeve. It comes off the top of the shock. It's done so that it can be done at the dealer's uh, level, very easy. And you can do a complete uh, air sleeve service as far as all the seals and O-rings because it comes off the front. And even some of the savvy consumers uh, can also do it as well. Perfect. I, I think I will, I will jump in and, and take the opportunity to say, hey, your Epics, this is a very high performance, high end uh, bicycle, and the the tolerances, the weights, the the system that we're working with, it has to be serviced. You know, it, it, you're you're beating the crap out of this bike in the in the dirt, in the mud, over the rocks, and things like that. So we've seen riders that go hundreds of hours without taking care of their suspension, and it's just not designed to work that way. And we're we're talking grams for the weight of these suspension. It's not the same as a car suspension. Uh, totally different performance characteristics. So uh, if you're having some issues with your shock, take it into your local retailer, and it probably just needs a service on that thing. Yeah, that's that's true. Yep. From Spin City, Epic. The question is, why no boost? It is a boost. Boom! <laughs> <laughs> well, 
148 spacing in the rear, 110 spacing in the front. Is that because we want them to run six fatty tires? No, it's because we want super stiff wheels to make to match the super stiff frame. Bang. Thanks, Spin City. Good question, though. Uh, this is from CW. I don't know who that is. Uh, will the new brain valve location be affected by brake heat? That's a great question. Um, we did a lot of testing, uh, checking the heat in that area, and it's not affected. Um, it, it, it doesn't transfer directly over to the reservoir, and the temperatures that that reservoir sees are so low um, that it doesn't have an effect on, on the system or uh, you know, the, uh, the overall damping. Uh, so CW, it's a good question. It is a good question. For yeah, sure. My question, though, is why are you using the brakes? It's an Epic. you got to go fast, man. <laughs> epic, is there a... Is there a World, World Cup, Cup platform, platform coming? We have gone to a single geometry that we believe suits marathon racers and World Cup racers alike with our new fork offset, a little bit slacker head tube angle. The bike is more confident, and I don't think that someone riding a World Cup track needs less confidence like the old bike. Yeah, and I think the uh, it's, it's a little bit, it's a hard to almost fathom the way this bike rides. And, and uh, for those that haven't gotten to ride it yet, one, you should, and two, trust us. We've been, in, we've been referring to this as a unicorn geometry. It absolutely still flies up the hill the way that you would expect, but it, while, while being more confident on the downhill. So uh, we feel that we, we don't need those two platforms now because it's, it's baked right into one. Epic question, what is the seat post size? 30.9. Yep. yep, nice and big. Can you can you run a dropper post on this? Brian's personal bike is sitting over here in the corner. Stormtrooper white, and he's got a 30.9 dropper post, 125 uh, drop on there. So if you're willing to sacrifice the weight, because Brian eats Oreos for breakfast and he's not worried about it, uh, you can absolutely run that. Our new carbon S-Works post that comes on the S-Works bikes is super light. It's about 183 grams, so a little bit lighter than the 27.2 one that we spec last year, about 30 grams lighter. Sam, remind the audience, Epic Embargo is July 1st. Hey, guys, July 1st, you'll be able to go into your retailers and find this bike ready to go. Uh, we also have our, our, uh, our trucks and vans out there with our super trusty brand developers that are ready to uh, get you on these bikes. We've got 30 Epics out in the market right now that you can go out and test, ride, see how fast you can go. Hey, Brian, Mick, Stephanie, Eric, Thanks so much for joining us. Chris, you hope you're doing well over there in the dwarf. Everybody, thanks for tuning in. Hopefully, you can go check out these new bikes and uh, throw a leg over them and have a, have a good time riding. We'll see you out there on the trails and on the road. Ciao, ciao.